Thus far in the semester, we've covered a, a rather large swath of Russian history, including everything from geography and climate to a good deal of politics. We've talked a little bit about social history, political history. We've done a little bit of military history and things like that. Tonight, we're going to spend our entire time together talking about ideas, about the ideas that began to emerge and percolate in educated Russian society in the, 19, in the 1820s and in the 1830s. And there are a couple of different things that are important about that particular period in Russian history. The 1820s and the 1830s are the moment in the aftermath of the, the Patriotic War, the defeat of Napoleon, in which the Russian peasant armies liberate all of Europe. And in the process, in the process, enter into European society as a fully fledged member of the major European states. The Russians in 1820 are right alongside the Prussians, the French, the British. This is arguably Russia's most influential period in all of its history in Europe until after the Second World War, when under the guise of the Soviet Union, right, Russia or the Soviet Union begins to exert a considerable amount of influence as well. So what we're going to talk about tonight in the, stand, in the context of these ideas, has a lot to do with Russia's newfound place in the European order, a place of power. After a hundred years of struggling, beginning with the reign of Peter the Great, to catch up with the West, Russia finds itself now in a position of authority and geopolitical power. That's one, that's one thing that's percolating. The other thing that's taking place is that this is a moment in which those young guards officers, and the peasants as well, who had traveled to Europe during the Napoleonic Wars, who had encountered European standards of living, who had encountered new Napoleonic ideas and new French ideas, rule of law, the concept of a constitution, the notion of a republic, have returned home to Russia to the poverty, the relative backwards, the backwardness, the illiteracy in the countryside, and the unchecked power of the autocrat, the Tsar. And, begun, and they begin asking themselves, well, wait a second. We've, we helped liberate Europe. They have constitutions in Europe. They have parliaments in Europe. They have societies, organizations that exist and function independent of the state without recourse to censorship, or at least censorship that's minimally applied as opposed to the kind of censorship that's going to be introduced in Russia toward the end of Alexander the First reign and at the outset of Nicholas the First reign. And they begin to wonder, what's wrong? What's wrong with us? Why can't we have what we've experienced in Europe? So Russia, the, the, the Russian state as a political entity is on par with Europe. But it is on par with Europe from the standpoint of its political culture in, in a way that European states would have recognized, say, at the end of the 17th or the beginning of the 18th century, under the reign of Louis XIV. But Europe has now moved on. It's moved on to constitutions. It's moved on to republican forms of government. The French Revolution has fired. The Enlightenment has fired all of these ideas in the minds of men. And Russians are going to be affected by this as well. The third thing that the Russians are encountering, the third thing that's going on in Imperial Russia, is the first technologies of that great industrial revolution that began unfolding in Great Britain in the middle of the 18th century, that has begun by the early 1820s to mid-1820s to begin shaping and altering the continent of Europe, those first technological fruits are going to begin making their way into Russia as well. And Russia is going to have a problem trying to adopt and diffuse the complex new technological systems that have emerged. Steamboats, railroads, a bit later in the 1850s and the 1860s, telegraphs, new forms of communication, new forms of transportation that require a great deal of capital investment to build railroads, to supply cars and locomotives, to build the track, to administer them. It costs a great deal of money, takes a great deal of technical expertise, it takes higher levels of education. These are the things the Russian state is struggling to adopt to in the 1820s and the 1830s with only limited success. This was the nature of last week's lecture, introducing you to Nicholas I, who at the same time he recognizes that the state, the state has a need 
for railroads and steamships, to augment transportation, to buttress its authority, and to maintain its, its military power. What Nicholas I does not want, he wants the technology, he doesn't want all of the ideas, the liberal ideas, the constitutional ideas, the call for reform that's underway in Europe. He doesn't want that arriving in Russia with the technology, with the new technical institutes, with the new educational establishments, with the necessary expansion of the periodical press that has to take place if you're going to generate the kind of technicians and experts and engineers that you have to have in order to adopt and diffuse this technology uh, in, a, in an efficient fashion. Does that make sense to everybody? So there's a real conundrum, there's a, qua there's a quandary here for the Russian state, but also for the educated members of Russian society. Not the peasants so much, who are heartbroken at the Prague, because there rumors have been spreading in 1814 and 1815 that following the end of the war, Alexander I was going to liberate them in payment for their, their, their service to the nation. No dice. And Alexander famously tells them they'll receive their reward in the next life. That's a small, you know, small comfort right, to the peasants who fought in the, in the ranks. But that emerging Russian educated society, exemplified in those Decemberist revolutionaries, those young guards officers, but this, this revolutionary new movement that the Decemberists have launched, this opposition to the autocracy, is going to begin picking up steam in the 1820s and especially the 1830s as Russians come to ask themselves questions. Questions that are generated by that encounter with Europe, by that encounter with European standards of living, that encounter with European institutions and ideas, and with the realization that back in home, back at home, despite the progress that had been made since Peter, why was Russia still behind? Why was Russia still behind the West? And tied to that, if you're going to question Russia's relationship with the West, what is the proper role of the state? What's the proper role of the autocracy in advancing progress? And if you continue to allow the state to provide the impetus for progress and modernization, at what cost does that entail for society? Seeing the process of industrial revolution unfold in Europe, especially in Great Britain, to which Russians are going to travel in some numbers in the 1830s, but more so in the 1840s and the 1850s, and we're going to encounter some of these travelers in, in ensuing weeks, Russians, uh, educated Russians are going to leave their homeland, they're going to travel to the West, they are going to visit London, Manchester, and Liverpool, these great new urban cities teeming. London's got over a million people. Manchester, 500,000 or so by the middle of the 19th century. And they are smoke-filled places of industry, of bustle, of commerce, of immense production, and in the inner cities where the laborers who work in the factories reside in in, uh, in dilapidated housing and unsanitary conditions, what these Russians see are not only the glorious products of the Industrial Revolution, but the costs that come with the Industrial Revolution. In teeming tenements and cesspools, lack of adequate water and sanitation, cholera outbreaks that are going to plague uh, London and plague other uh, British cities into the 1840s and the 1850s because the cities are ill-equipped to deal with the mass of people that are surging in off the farms and into the factories. And what Russians ask themselves are, well, if we've modeled ourselves, as Peter has told us after, as Peter recognized, after Europe of, say, of the 18th century, now when we look to England, when we see the factories, we see the railroads, we see the steamships, aren't we in fact seeing Russia's future? And if that is the case, would it not be possible, knowing what the future entails from the standpoint of industry and technology, would it not be possible to avoid the social dislocation, the economic exploitation, the political unrest that accompanies the Industrial Revolution in Europe? Is there, is there not a better path to Russian development? What should Russia's future hold? These are the questions that educated Russians are asking themselves in the 1830s and the 1840s. They are at the very center of a debate as to what constitutes, in fact, Russia 
as a nation today and as an entity and as a nation in the future. There's another development that's underway in the 1820s and the 1830s, and it's beyond Russia. It, it embraces most of Western and Central Europe, and the Russians are going to be deeply affected by it. And that is the movement away from embracing French ideas of the 18th century, <coughs> those ideas of enlightenment that had been expounded by people uh, like, like uh, John Locke, like Montesquieu and Voltaire, that had emphasized reason, progress, individual uh, responsibility to a certain extent, but that underscored as well the idea of the perfectibility of humankind. All of those Enlightenment ideas had been bandied about. We talked about Russia's troubled Enlightenment under Catherine the Great. Catherine is grappling with these ideas, trying to implement them and trying to give some degree of free thinking to people like Novikov, encouraging implicitly the thoughts of someone like Alexander Radishev until she decides, wait a minute, that's too much. It threatens ultimately autocratic authority. And that's when she's going to backtrack in the aftermath of the French Revolution. This is the force that the Enlightenment has ultimately unleashed. It's unleashed the fury of the French people, led initially by educated members, journalists, lawyers, literateurs who occupy the Estates General. They're going to be pushed further and further to the radical left as the revolution begins to devour its own children. This is what Catherine fears. There is a reaction in Russia and really across Central Europe against the Enlightenment. And it begins to percolate under Napoleon's rule. The French are seen as occupying forces. All the members of the, of the Prussian, of the Italian, of the Austrian middling classes, the educated property owners, embrace aspects of the, of the Napoleonic codes. Protection of private property, due process, the abolition of the old privileges entailed to the aristocracy. They, they embrace those ideals, but they reject French culture. They reject French culture. And what comes to replace the Enlightenment, the French Enlightenment, that had dominated thinking in the late 18th century and around the turn of the 19th century, French Enlightenment gives way to a new intellectual and artistic movement that is known as Romanticism. Where the French lead the way with the Enlightenment, it is going to be a different cultural center around which Romanticism is going to arise. Who opposes the French? Most Europeans. Well, most, yeah, most everybody. The English. Go. The English, but also... Russians, Prussians. The German-speaking lands. Okay. And Romanticism is going to be born in the German-speaking And We're going to have English Romantics. We'll have a few French Romantics. But it's, it's the Germans, the Germans who are going to lead the way in propagating a new intellectual and artistic movement that is known as Romanticism. And, and this cultural shift that takes place, it begins to take place yeah, around the turn of the 19th century, but it really comes into its full flowering in the 1820s and the 1830s. It's initiated by people like this fellow, Johann Gottfried von Herder. Romanticism is seen by some as the great first protest movement. It's a protest movement against that rational scientific civilization that had been born of the French Enlightenment. Where Enlightenment thinkers embraced universalism, objectivity, and empiricism, Romantic thinkers like Herder, like Schelling, Goethe, uh, and Fichte, and other, others, they are going to conceive of values that are almost the polar opposite. I, I think I mentioned in here that the great metaphor in the 18th century for the Enlightenment was the idea of the universe being constructed like a clock, this mechanistic view, right? And if you studied society, if you applied the values and principles and the procedures of the scientific process to studying society just like Newton had uncovered the laws of the universe, by studying society, you could uncover the laws of human activity. This is what good thinking you know, founding fathers in the United States called you know, the, the, the natural laws. From whence do these laws emanate? They emanate from nature that all men are created equal. And we understand that today to mean not only men, but, but women as well. All humans are created equal. That you could discern the laws by which you could structure society. And that if you simply tinkered with it enough, if you altered institutions, if you undertook reform, you could improve society and make 
society more perfect. That's the Enlightenment view. That's the French view in the 18th century. The Germans say, yeah, not so much. Where French Enlightenment thinkers perceive society as being mechanistic, German Romantics perceive society as being organic. Organic. There's a very, you can't have a bigger difference between the machine and nature. Organic. Romantics view to each society as being a natural organic entity possessing its own spirit. The German word is Geist. Each nation it's not a machine that can be tinkered with. You move the bits and pieces around and you create a functioning society. It's an organic thing evolving slowly towards its own destiny. Now, in the world of nature, we look organically about this room and, well, what we see is a dichotomy. There's a dichotomy. There's the younger generation sitting in seats and there's the old fart standing up here talking, right? <laughs> Organically, if we, under, if we understand a nation to evolve like an organism, organisms have a beginning, they have a youth, right? They're born, they have a youth, they, have, they mature, they have a middle age, they grow old and decrepit, and then they die. Like Rome, like Greece. And this is what the Romantics are thinking. Now, it's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that Germans would come up with this. German speakers would come up with this. There's a French nation. How do you identify what constitutes a French nation? Well, what the German Romantics are going to tell you is that you identify the, the nature and the spirit of a nation based upon things that are unique to it. Its language, its culture, its traditions, its folklore, all of which are embodied in the traditions of what the Germans call Das Volk. What's Das Volk? The people. The people. The people. Das Volk. So the people are the repository of the spirit of the nation. And they reflect that national spirit in language and culture and folklore. It's not a coincidence. You heard the Brothers Grimm? This is when they're acting. This is when they're gathering up German folklore. Okay? The Russians have a term that's equivalent to Das Volk. A collective noun. It's not wrong. Stress on the O, the D sounds like a T. Narod. That's what it looks like in Russian. Narod. And following, following Germans like, uh, like, like Herder, like Schelling and others, Russians are going to latch on to these romantic ideas in the 1820s and the 1830s. Here's the curious thing. I, I just mentioned these nations are, are they're organic entities. They're young, they grow, they mature, they die. The French, young or old, if you're a German? French or old. What about the German nation? Well, something. Wait, which one? What do you mean, Calvi? Which one? The German state. Where's the German nation? Well, there's the there Prussians, one. there's the German. It doesn't exist yet. It's, this is yeah. the Holy Roman Empire, the German nation. <laughs> Where's Germany in the 1820s? It doesn't exist. There is no German state. <laughs> They're all, it's like Bavaria. They're a collection of German principalities, but there is no unified German state. Is Germany a young nation or an old nation? It's not a nation. Very young, apparently. Which means its future is ahead of it, right? It's ahead of it. There's no German nation. Well, I should say there's a German nation. The German-speaking peoples who are united by their language, their culture, their folklore. This is what the Brothers Grimm are out doing. They're gathering up these, Ger these, these German folk tales because they're trying to demonstrate the existence of a German nation that exists in the absence of a unified German state. Begins to understand now why, why, why this is coming from the Germans. How about the Russians? How, do, how long has Russia been around as a state? Well, Russia's kind of always identified as a state. Yeah, well, yeah, Russia's always kind of identified itself as a state. There's something to be said about that. What's curious is that the Russians are going to pick up on these romantic ideas. And one of the people who's very important in this regard is a historian by the name of 
Nikolai Karamzin. You'll need to know this one. Nik Karamzin, K-A-R-A-M-Z-I-N. Nikolai. It'll, it'll have all the terms on the uh, on on the on the website uh, tonight. Wait, how you again? Karamzin. K-A-R-M. Hell, I'll just write it out. I can't. I can't write and talk at the same time, or can't talk and spell. R Z Nikolai. He produces a monumental study. It's published in twelve volumes between 1818 and 1829, and he describes the glories of Kiev and the Rus of the powerful Muscovite state, and he identifies the state as the essential force for Russia's peace and stability. He would write in his history, quote, wise people love order. There is no order without autocratic power. Now, Karamzin is, he is a historian of the Russian state, but what's important about him from the Romantic context is he provides the Russian educated elite with their first national history. And you can go to Karamzin's work by 1830 and you can read about the evolution of the Russian state across millennia. And in the aftermath of the Napoleonic War and Russia's victory, this instills even more pride in the Russians. This encourages many Russian thinkers to emerge even more from under the influence of, of Europe, and especially the French. We talked about the extent to which Russian culture, court culture especially, is dominated by the French at the end of the 18th century. We have Russian nobles speaking French better than they do even, Russia's, uh, even, even Russian. The other thing that is going to transpire is that just as the brothers Grimm are out gathering up those folklores about the, uh, the German past, so too is a Russian folklorist, a fellow by the name of Ivan Krylov. Uh, Krylov, Krylov, excuse me, stress on the, uh, stress on the O. Uh, Ivan uh, uh, Krylov. He undertakes uh, the collection of, of uh, fables, kind of like Aesop's fables. He goes out in the countryside and he collects these things. He writes some of his own up. He draws upon historical events to create original works and almost immediately they're recognized as classics. What begins happening in the 1820s and the 1830s is Russian painters and poets and playwrights and musicians begin moving away from simply aping or copying Western fashions. And they begin adapting Russian traditions, Russian cultural folk music from the peasants, or you're going to work its way into, uh, in, into Russian uh, music uh, by the 1830s. There's no better example of this than a poem, or not a poem, excuse me, uh, an opera uh, that it, it is called initially Ivan Susanin, and the the uh, the musician is a fellow by the name of Mikhail Glinka, and in 1836 <clears throat> he debuts his poem Ivan Susanin. Now, what is the story about? Ivan Susanin is a, is a peasant hero who comes down to us in, 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 the, in the narrative tradition emanating out of the time of troubles. That period, remember, um, after Boris Godunov um, dies, uh, when Russia is beset by external enemies, the Poles, uh, the, the, the evil, terrible, awful Lithuanians, those nasty folks from the Baltic, Baltic states, got you there, Lauren. The Poles arrive in a local village, and the story tells us that this peasant, the Ivan Susanin, in order to preserve the life of the, of the, of the, of the Tsar to be crowned and the Zemsky Sobor, Ivan Susanin leads the Poles out into the wilderness. He tells them that he knows a shortcut that will take them to where the Zemsky Sobor is convening. The Poles are going to kill these people and end any prospect for the creation of a new Russian dynasty. What Susanin does instead is he leads them out into the wilderness, and after a while, given that the, 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 uh, the nobles had a chance to escape, the Poles come to realize that Susanin has engaged in a treacherous act. They fall upon him and they kill him. But he has sacrificed himself for the nation. Ivan Susanin is the initial name that Mikhail Glinka uh, wants to give the opera. But on opening night, Nicholas I, the Tsar, is there. And what Glinka does, remember we talked about how important patronage is? He hastily scrubs out the name and he renames the opera A Life 
for the Tsar. So you're drawing now upon patriotic themes and folklore. This is a truly, this is the first truly Russian opera. So poets, painters, playwrights, musicians are going to begin adapting these things. Not all of the historically based cultural productions are politically correct, the way that uh, Glinka's Ivan Susanin was. There will be some uh, minor poets who write poetry and verse that are that, are, that question perhaps a little bit the role of the Tsar. One is a fellow by the name of Kondraty Vrulyev. Um, my first name, Kondraty. Vrulyev uh, is an editor and co-publisher of a short-lived journal called The Polar Star, and he writes a, a series of ballads focusing on the deeds of heroic figures. One of his ballads is about Susanin, just like Glinka's opera. But he also writes about the Ukrainian leader Ivan Mazepa, who had revolted against Peter the Great during the, uh, the, the war against Sweden, the Great Northern War. Rolyev is going to champion Republican ideas. He embraces the French revolutionaries. Uh, he is going to be hanged just short of his 31st birthday. Rolyev had been a leading member of the Decemberist conspiracy. So what we're seeing here is the influence of these European ideas once again on Russia. And Russians are beginning to rethink, rethink now the meaning. What does it mean to be Russian? What does it mean to be Russian in the context of an autocratic state? The work from the 1830s, the most important work from the 1830s, and the one that really, from a literary and artistic standpoint, sets the tone for discussion and debate is an epic poem called The Bronze Horseman. Set, setting aside just the, the, the brilliance, the literary brilliance of the Bronze Horseman, one of the, one of the reasons that I wanted you folks to read this thing through, and we spent some time reading it aloud, is, is to point out the important role that this poem, this epic poem, plays in helping to establish an ongoing debate, a debate that is in some ways um, going to dominate Russian history, Soviet history, and post-Soviet history to the present day. It inaugurates a series of themes and a series of issues. We're going to talk about these as they unfolded in the 1930s, the time that we have remaining. Pushkin's poem, in establishing sort of the ambivalent role of Peter the Great in Russian history, it asks people or encourages people for the first time to, to raise questions about exactly what the Tsar's role was. Karamzin's history of the Russian state did not do this. Karamzin's history glorified the Russian state. And as we've seen with Bronze Horseman, you can find elements in that poem where Pushkin really does seem to admire Peter, but there are elements in which the idol seems to be maybe not so much uh, something that, that should be admired. Yes, ma'am? And the Tsar was still his personal... Well, here's the thing. I'm glad you asked that, because that's, that's one of the things I wanted to mention. The... Uh, the government censors would not allow this to be published. The only thing that appeared in print was that prologue, that, that glorious prologue that celebrated Peter and the founding of St. Petersburg. When the, when the Bronze Horseman does finally appear in print, it's only after Pushkin's uh, uh, premature death in, in 1837. And the, the, the edition of the Bronze Horseman that is released is, is censored all the same. So it's not the full text. The full text isn't, isn't published uh, until later in the 19th century. So those ideas didn't matter? Not everything. Well, they're, they're, again, it's Pushkin knows folks. It's a small educated society. Uh, the ideas are going to <coughs> circulate. We're going to talk about another fellow who's really going to take this theme and launch it. 
um, you know, in a way that Pushkin's law enforcement initially did not. But the point that I want to make is we've established now this theme in Russia's literary tradition. Uh, Pushkin, by the way, he meets his end uh, in, in no small part as a result of his fiery romantic personality. There is a, a foreign nobleman. Uh, Pushkin is absolutely certain that this foreign nobleman uh, is, is on the make uh, for Pushkin's wife, a woman by the name of Natalia Goncharova. Uh, and Pushkin, fiery temperament, like a Lord Byron, for those who know uh, English romantics, Pushkin challenges the man to a duel. <laughs> Dueling was illegal in Russia, but it happened. Pushkin's problem in, in challenging the man to a duel is, is that Pushkin's dueling skills were not that great, and the man whom he chose or he, he challenged to a duel was recognized as being one of the most accurate with a pistol in probably the entire country. Both are wounded in the exchange. Uh, Pushkin's wounds turn out to be fatal. He dies a couple of days after being shot. And he's going to die in 1837 uh, at, a, at a very, very tender age. This is all around his wife? It, uh, over, over the issue of whether or not the nobleman was, had, you know, Natalia, he was on the make uh, to, uh, to have an affair with Natalia. But this, of course, only adds, as you, if, you know, if, if you know anything about English literature, uh, Lord Byron, yeah. well, I mean, aside from just being a fantastic poet, he dies in perfectly heroic, romantic way of fighting for Greek independence. Live fast, die young. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> live fast, die young. That's one of the things about the romantics. It's almost, you know, if, if you don't die young, you, you sort of failed in your purpose as a romantic poet or a romantic uh, literary figure. Now, the point of all this is that Peter's bronze horseman is, is going to sort of initiate this uh, a debate that is going to be ongoing, folks, until the present day in Russian history regarding Russia's relationship to the West, regarding the state's relationship to modernization, regarding the relationship of the every man and the every woman to the power of the autocratic or later the power of the, of the one-party state in the Soviet Union. Pushkin does this in a literary fashion. The individual, however, who is going to really launch this into public discussion, and by public, by public I mean the, the relatively closed circles of the educated elite in St. Petersburg and Moscow. We're not talking yet at, at this point about mass circulation press. You have some magazines, you have literary journals. These are not reaching millions and millions of Russian subjects. That's going to come later in the 19th century. Do we have this already in France? And in England in the 1820s and the 1830s, we do. We do. That's part of that, that, that the, the, the retarded Russian development. Yes, ma'am? The poem was in the rest of Europe? No, no. no. What, I'm, what I'm saying is that this idea that the, you have a mass circulation press. You okay. don't have a mass circulation press. You have the publishing, uh, li relatively limited publishing vis-a-vis -vis the West. You don't have mass circulation newspapers being published in hundreds of thousands of copies and circulating to a wide audience the way that you do in, say, London already by the 1830s or the 1840s. The ideas that we're about to talk about, ideas propagated by a very interesting fellow by the name of Pyotr or Peter Shadayev, these are going to circulate in the form of manuscripts. Now, I'll explain that here in just a second. Let me say a few things briefly about Shadayev himself. Shadayev was a close friend of Alexander Pushkin's. And this, this makes sense. Again, we're talking about a relatively small circle of educated noble elites. They all know one another. They're not hanging out with peasants. They're hanging out with one another in and around court, in and around St. Petersburg, in and around Moscow. Chudaya was a veteran of the Patriotic War against Napoleon. Um, in 1821, he gives up a promising military career. He simply retires. What he would have done after the war is he would have risen through the ranks, presumably, of the military, would have worked his way up to a high officer level. He retires. When did he retire? 1821. Four years before the December Rebellion. And he embarks upon a program of personal study and travel in Western Europe. So he abandons Russia and goes into almost like a, a self-imposed temporary exile. He returns in 1826. Having spent five years abroad traveling, reading, experiencing things, oh, and also converting to Roman Catholicism. Yeah, so there's that. In any event, he comes back in about 1826 and returns to Moscow, Russia's second capital, and withdraws into almost complete seclusion. Now, what you would expect is, you know, the nobleman having traveled abroad is going to come back. He's going to go to soirees and parties. Uh, he's going to visit the salons, 
that are now regular features of intellectual noble life in Russia. The salons, those Enlightenment era institutions that you have bubble up in France. This would have been the private parties that would be hosted by the nobles. They're going to invite Voltaire or Montesquieu or Diderot to read a portion of a manuscript to discuss and debate. Salon life is now part and parcel of the culture of the educated elite in Moscow, St. Petersburg, and in other large cities. But Moscow and St. Petersburg is where the action really takes place. So he withdraws into almost complete seclusion to concentrate his efforts on formulating a new world view. Between 1828 and 1831, he writes a series of short works that are known collectively as the philosophical letters. The philosophical letters. And the only one we care about is the only one published during his lifetime. And that is philosophical letter number one. Imagine that. Philosophical letter number one which dealt with Russia. It was the only one, like I said, published in his lifetime. This letter, philosophical letter number one, is equivalent in its impact to Alexander Radishev's journey from St. Petersburg to Moscow. That was, remember, Radishev during the reign of Catherine II, he writes this, uh, this quote, his travel log about encountering peasants along the route between the two capitals, a scathing indictment of, of, of serfdom. A fundamental tectonic sea change, it's, you know, Radishev is, is arrested, he's sent into exile, but the manuscript circulates in the underground, okay, among, uh, among the, uh, the elite. Chidayev's first philosophical letter is going to be published uh, in the journal Telescope. The journal is called Telescope, or Telescope, in 1836. And in the immediate aftermath of its publication, Shadayev rockets to almost overnight celebrity, or what we would call celebrity. Shadayev is the guy that you want to invite to your soiree. He is the one you want at your salon. He has written the single most interesting thing about society and about Russia that has been written in quite some time. This is a year, of course, before Bronze Horseman. Bronze Horseman is 1837. Uh, that's when uh, the, the, the initial prologue is going to be published. He is the one all of Moscow's elite want to invite to the party. And he is now persona non grata in the eyes of the autocratic state. His ideas are so provocative that Nicholas I intervenes and orders that the journal telescope be immediately closed, that its editor be dispatched to Siberia, and the censor who somehow mistakenly approved this thing for publication be summarily dismissed with the loss of his status and his pension. Shadayev is declared officially insane and is placed under house arrest and compelled uh, to be visited daily by a medical physician, establishing a precedent that will be revisited in the Soviet period of subjecting Soviet dissidents to treatment in psychiatric hospitals. The difference here being uh, that the uh, Soviet dissidents would be force-fed psychotropic drugs uh, or uh, be subjected to uh, electrical shock therapy. It's not going to happen to Jedi, but he's been he's been declared in the Senate. Good Lord, what could the man possibly have written? What could you say that would entail or would deserve such uh, uh, treatment? Jedi's offense was pretty simple. He called into question the nature of the Russian past. That this this idea here of the patriotic Russia that's been bubbling up now since Kadamzin's work. Kadamzin's work has been circulating for almost a decade. People are reading it. Uh, Glinka's uh, uh, play, A Life for the Tsar, is going to debut in 1836, the same year as uh, Philosophical Letter No. 1. He calls into question the nature of the Russian past, or I guess it's probably more accurate to say he asserts that the nation had no past. It has no present. It has no future. Chudayev's claim is that Russia exists outside of world history. The world history that is being unfolded 
and controlled and led by the West. In contrast with the innovative and industrial peoples of the French lands, the German-speaking lands, the British lands, in contrast with them, in contrast with Europe, that had constructed a vibrant civilization over the centuries, Russia had only, and I quote, brutal barbarism, then crude superstition, then cruel and humiliating foreign domination, the spirit of which was later inherited by our national rulers. This is, of course, an allusion to the Mongols, to the Tatars. Tatars have come and invaded, they deposed their will, and what was it that the Russian rulers absorbed from the Tatars? Cruelty. Ruled effectively by Tatar hordes, disguised here as, uh, as, as, as Russian rulers. Western genius devised technical and scientific foundations that would establish the modern world. Remember, this is a time of steamships, steam engines, railways, gradually going to be introduced into Russia, Shadayev has traveled in Europe for five years. He's seen these new emerging wonders of the Industrial Revolution. He is impressed by all get out hell. He converts, like I said, to Roman Catholicism. And he looks to Russia and he says to himself, oh my Lord, poor Russia. The Russians, Shadayev is going to write, speaking specifically here about the role of what we've seen already this semester, adopting techniques, adopting strategies, adopting institutions from abroad, going all the way back to Peter the Great. Shadayev is going to write, like children who have never been made to think for themselves, Russians had absorbed nothing from this process of borrowing and imitation. He continues, since we Russians accept only ready-made ideas, the ineradicable traces which a progressive movement of ideas engraves in the mind and which gives ideas their forcefulness makes no furrow on our intellect. In other words, what he's saying is the process of having to think it through and do it on your own makes it part of who you are. You're having to think it through. That's what ingrains it on your mind. We simply accept what people have already thought. We accept ready-made ideas. We grow, but we do not mature. We advance, but obliquely. That is, in a direction which does not lead us to the goal. Russia has accepted ready-made ideas. They think nothing through for themselves. And so their adoption of these Western customs and technologies and values is entirely superficial. It's not ingrained in Russians the way that it is ingrained on entrepreneurial spirit, um, adherence to the rule of law, the value of individual life, liberty, and freedom. Judaism's critique implicitly acknowledged that Russia's failing was its inability to, to adopt an internal cultural sense of dynamism of the likes of which had been fostered uh, in Europe and that had led to Europe's material and moral progress. His letter makes him a cause celeb in Russia and it also scandalizes Russian opinion. What Shadayev does is he, he launches with his philosophical letter number one a scathing critique of Russian history. And what scandalized Russian opinion is, it's, it's, a t it's, a, it's, a, it's a critique that really bites to the quick, but he's not offering any solution. He's basically saying, Russians, we suck. <laughs> we, and he, we've given nothing at all to the world. That's actually, it's one of the, uh, that's one of the, uh, the thing I want to quite, I forgot to quote this. Uh, the Western genius has devised the technical uh, and, and scientific foundations of the modern world, but he writes, we Russians did not bother to invent anything. While from the inventions of others, we borrowed only the deceptive appearances and the useless luxuries. We're adopting this stuff because the state wants us to. We're learning this stuff because the state orders us to. We're not thinking for ourselves. We are not fully mature. We are children. Wow. This is what sets off Nicholas I. <coughs> it's an indictment in some ways of the entire autocratic system. What ends up happening is he's placed under house arrest, he's declared legally insane, and an inquiry is, is launched into the publication of his letter. Now, Chidayev realizes he's in a bit of a quandary. <laughs> he's really, he's really crossed the threshold. 
you know, what's to be done about it. He starts thinking some more. And it's only when he's under house arrest <coughs> that he turns uh, to reading belatedly Karamzin's History of the Russian State. All right, and that gets him to thinking. He ends up writing another uh, treatise. It's ironically titled, Apology of a Madman. Today, he's got a, the guy's got a sense of humor. You gotta give the guy credit. The Apology of a Madman, he declared legally sane. Okay, fine. Apology of a Madman. And what this, what this, what this next publication does is it softens a bit, <coughs> excuse me, it softens a bit the harshest critique that he's launched. And the, he offers up sort of a way out, we can call it, a way out, a way that Russians can work their way out of this quandary. He continues to maintain that, no, 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 the nation has stood apart. Russia has stood apart from history of human progress. Since, uh, up until now, he says, <laughs> up until now, he says, Peter's right. <clears throat> He writes an apology of a madman. In his hand, in Peter's hand, Peter the Great found only a blank sheet of paper. On it he wrote Europe and the West. From that time on, we were part of Europe and part of the West. The problem that Shia Chidayev now is arguing is that Russia has arrived belatedly to what contemporaries then would have identified as a modern era. But the benefit to this the benefit to Russia's late arrival, the benefit to Russia's adopting Western ways late, only under the reign of Peter. The benefit, Shadayev says, is that unencumbered by established interests, unencumbered by traditions, unencumbered by the prejudices of the past, Russia now possesses the freshness and the enthusiasm of the newcomer. The Russians, can see the future. They can see it in the West. They can see those institutions. Russia is blessed with an opportunity to plan its own destiny. This is the origin of Russian backwardness. The idea that Russia has come late to the European order, that it was brought to the European order, in some ways kicking and screaming by fear. But now that the Russians are there, as a latecomer, go back to what we talked about with the Rampas, an organism organically growing, young, and the Germans are young and fresh, they don't have a state. Look at what Chidayev has done, it's very clever. He's redefined Russian history. Russian history doesn't exist before Peter. That's what he's saying he meant now in philosophical letter number one. Russians had no history. Oh, but once Peter arrives, now we have a history. We have come late. We are backward relative to the West, but because we are a young nation, we have the advantages of being able to see where we're going and being able to chart our own <coughs> destiny toward that end. Does that make sense? So like the oldest nation. Ah, this is very clever though. He's a very, very clever man. Russia's real history, he's saying, begins with Peter the Great. All the stuff that came before, barbarism, backwardness, superstition, Obscurantism. Yeah, that's, that's the uh, Russia is a new young nation, and it's it's a very clever way of, of appropriating that German sense of Herder and Schilling and, and Fichte and the rest. Well, the Germans are a young nation. We know we're a young nation. We don't have a state. Shadai is saying, well, you know, we have a state, but it's only been around for a hundred years since Peter. All that Muscovite stuff, all that Kievan stuff, that doesn't count. That's what Shadayev does, and that's what makes it so clever. Ch Shadayev's first philosophical letter now, it's going to inaugurate a debate that is going to continue throughout the course of the rest of, the, of this class. Russia's relationship to the West. What does it mean? What does it mean that Russia has arrived late to the process of state formation in a modern sense? Is obviously is arriving late to the process of European industrialization. We're going to find out is arriving late uh, to the process of the emergence of what we would refer to as civil society. How does, how does Russia relate to Europe in that regard? And what is the best path for Russia, recognizing now that Russia can see more or less its ultimate destination? 
Its ultimate destination is going to be something akin to British industrial society, British urban society. That's coming. It's not here yet, but it's coming. How do we get there? Can we do it a different way? Do we have to do exactly what it is the British did? Can we forge our own path? This debate in the 1830s and the 1840s is going to, uh, is going to emerge as a result of Chediah's writings. Later on, when Pushkin's Bronze Horseman is published in the censored version, it feeds it a bit. Much later on, of course, when it's published in full, people recognize, ah, Pushkin was in on this too. And it's, again, it's not coincidental that Chediah and Pushkin know each other. These were the kinds of ideas and things that were being discussed behind the scenes in private conversations. They're going to emerge then into these literary works. As soon as that first philosophical letter appears, educated, public opi educated opinion in Russia comes to regard Chadayev as one of the most influential people, one of the in most influential thinkers in all of Russian history. Chadayev's philosophical letter, followed by his apology of a madman, is going to inaugurate a centuries-long debate over Russia's relationship to the West. Now that is Europe in the 19th century, it's the United States in the second half of the 20th century. It's a debate continues to this very day. What Chediah's philosophical letter does immediately is it gives rise to two intellectual camps. These are not political parties. Political parties are illegal in Nicholas I Russia. There are no political parties. There are no representative assemblies. There's no place to go to, to debate political ideas that's illegal. The two groups that emerge come to be known as the Westernizers and the Slavophiles. These two groups are going to form the first generation of something that comes to be called the Russian intelligentsia, hard G, intelligentsia. We'll be talking about the, 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 the evolution, the changing nature and ideas of the intelligentsia for the rest of the semester. Who are they? Well, generally speaking, members of the intelligentsia are, are from the educated elite. They have, dis, they have a personal dissatisfaction with the existing social order. They are alienated from the state, and they are going to be drawn into opposition against the autocracy. I talked several weeks ago, and we talked about the rise of the, the institution of the table of ranks and the imposition of the service state that Peter devises, the extent to which those state servitors were at the mercy, the beck and call of the autocrat. Every bit the way that a, a gentryman serfs were at the beck and call of the nobleman. You have no personal rights, you have no personal autonomy, you're given access to European education, you are given privileges as a result of the fact that you are a member of the nobility and that you are serving the state, but you have no legal protections of any kind for your status. Resentment, alienation, growing opposition to the autocracy is going uh, to develop in this atmosphere because one of the things that the state absolutely has to have, it has to have educated subjects. Increasingly in this emerging industrial world, you have to have technicians, you have to have engineers, you have to have mechanics, they have to be able to do things. You are going to require an increasingly literate society as the 19th century rolls on. But people who are literate, if they can read for themselves, they can also think, think, for, themselves. think for themselves. And that's one of the quandaries the autocracy has. It needs people who can think but it doesn't want people who can think for themselves. So, what we want in the time that we have uh, left tonight, I'm going to introduce you here to the main main ways of thinking <coughs> here between our Westernizers and our Slavophiles. The individuals um, who come to be uh, who come to be associated with the Westernizing branch of the intelligentsia, they actually are a very diverse group, and they embrace a wide and evolving range of views regarding Russia's development. All of them, however, agree in general that Russia would need to pursue modernization after the broad manner in which modernization had been undertaken in Europe. They admire Peter the Great, generally. They view him as a revolutionary figure in Russian history. 
They recognized Peter as being great because he showed the world, he showed Russians, first of all, that it was possible to compete with and best the Europeans. That, folks, is why that Napoleonic War is so damn important. That is really, I mean, it's coming 100 years almost after Peter's death. But that is the fruit that Russia harvests from Peter's modernization program. Russia has, at the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, an army that is capable of going toe-to-toe against Europe's greatest army, the army of Napoleon Bonaparte, the Grand Army. And it's not just Father Frost, or General Frost, that defeats Napoleon. Borodino, the battle that takes place outside the gates of Moscow, is effectively a draw. The Russians fight, they fight well, and they at least match Napoleon on the battlefield. That is a source of immense pride. How could they do that? They did that because of Peter the Great's revolution in the early 18th century that built the industrial, the economic, and the military framework and foundation for it. Following Peter's example, they advocate, the westernizers do, the adoption of European institutions, ideas, and practices. But, but here's the rub. It was one thing to uphold the West as a model during the 18th century. Because the political model of Europe in the 18th century, say in 1740, 1750, was the absolutist European state. It was Europe of Louis XIV. Okay, it was the absolute state of Europe of Louis XIV. What has happened since then in the 1830s? Well, you can hold up that model of Western development from a technological and economic standpoint, but after the French Revolution, in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, both of which sort of upended old regime Europe and had cast the continent into a state of ongoing intellectual and political turbulence, where in the West you've got the competing demands between the propertied interest of the middle class, the demand for urban industrial workers for a bigger share of the pie, the emergence of new political ideologies. In the West you have liberals and conservatives, republicans and socialists. They're all competing with one another through the ballot box. Sometimes they're fighting in the streets. Where's the model? You, you don't have a single absolute state model in the 1830s the way that you had in, say, the 1720s under Peter, right? Because all the states in Europe were absolutist states. Now you've got, well, you know, the, the British being sort of the, the odd man out there, not entirely an absolutist state. They've got a parliament and things like that. But now what you have, is it Republican France? Is it constitutional monarchy France? Is it, the, is it the British? Is it the Prussians, which maintain a degree of autocratic control and cohesion? What is the model? There is no single model now. That's one of the quandaries the westernizers face. So this is the dilemma posed by Europe's dynamism. It's compounded by the fact that the Russian autocracy under Nicholas I doesn't want to change one jot. So at a time when these, these young men and the, and the members of the intelligentsia, the westernizers and Slavophiles, they're 20-somethings. They're early 30-somethings. They're still relatively young men. They have ideas. They have hopes. They have aspirations. Is there any chance that they're going to be able to implement these kinds of ideas? under an autocratic system ruled by an obscurant and arch-conservative in Nicholas I? No, there's not. Where do you go if you have ideas opposite those of the state? Where do you go to discuss things? Well, you could discuss things in private. And what emerges in the course of uh, the 18, um, 18 teens, but it really, begins, it really begins spreading in the late 1820s, the early 1830s, is the emergence of something known as the Kruzhok. It's a Russian word meaning circle. And what it specifically refers to in this context is a discussion circle. A discussion circle. It's the sort of thing that, 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 that college-age students would have done back in the 80s, before the internet, before Facebook and, and tweeting and all this stuff where you have social media so that you can stand alienated and all alone in your room, staring at your screen, engaging in what? I don't know, being a twit. You know what I call people who tweet? Twits, not Twitter, they're twits. 
<laughs> you, would, you would come together in a small apartment, you know, someone's house, and you would discuss ideas, you would debate them. It, it emerges out of that 18th century concept in France, the salon. Sort of a, 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 a private, maybe quasi-public uh, thing where you would be invited if you were a leading thinker or if you were a member of high society and, you were, and, your, and your opinions and ideas were considered to be worthwhile. As the rich benefactor, I would invite you to my lovely place in the 18th century salon and we would read Voltaire's latest work in progress. And maybe Voltaire, if I was you know, sufficiently high up in the social hierarchy, Voltaire would come and he would do a reading, or, or Montesquieu would. The Crujoc is not quite as, as um, august an institution. It's an informal association that emerges really uh, dominated by, by young folks, especially those at university. And between 1801 and 1855, it's estimated that as many as 400 of these discussion circles sprout up across the empire. Most of them are in St. Petersburg and Moscow, the two capitals. One is going to be established at Moscow University in 1831. It's established by a fellow named Nikolai Stankiewicz. You don't have to remember his name since we're not doing Russian intellectual history. Nikolai, but there it is, Nikolai Stankiewicz. At Moscow University, so you have university students, they come, and the idea was that you would debate ideas, you would discuss things. And the Stankiewicz circle is going to number amongst some of the most influential thinkers of the 19th century. Yeah, we don't, we're not, I'm not going to go into all of them today um, because I don't have time. One of them I do want you to know, though, is a fellow by the name of Viserion Belinsky, B E L I. N S K Y, Viserion Belinsky. He is a member of the Stankiewicz Circle, and he is going to emerge as the leading voice of the first generation of the Westernizers. He is a writer and a journalist, Belinsky. Belinsky is, is, is the best, he's the leading voice of the Westernizers of the very first generation. He was, an, he was a brilliant but inconsistent thinker. Uh, he, he enthusiastically welcomed technological progress. He hailed railroads and steamships as, quote, our century's greatest victories. Victories not only over matter, but victories over time and space. He's going to utilize his position as an editor and literary critic for a series of journals to advocate European ideas and institutions. But he also emphasizes philosophy, literature, and the arts. Why is literature so important to Russians today in a way that Americans have trouble understanding? And why was it so important to Russians in the 19th century? In no small part because of Viserion Belinsky. What he is chiefly known for, and where he really has his lasting influence, is he uses his, posi his, his position as a writer, as an editor, to argue, to argue that it is the writer's duty to serve as the moral compass of the nation. Writers. Writers are the moral compass of the nation. This is a very romantic idea. This is actually tied to German romanticism of the 1920s and 1930s. German romantic thinkers, in addition to arguing that societies and nations were organic things, they believed, they, they did believe in progress, like the Enlightenment thinkers, but they believed, they believed that you could arrive at progress via differing routes. You, you weren't set, you know, it wasn't like a scientific method of the Enlightenment. Well, if you do A, B, C, and D, you'll make it to the, to the promised land of progress. What the Romantic the Germans thought is that progress could be attained, but progress was a subjective thing, not an objective thing. Objective means there's one thing that we all recognize is very empirical. Subjective means that progress could come about in different ways, and each individual was capable of attaining progress or attaining understanding of the greater world after his or her own fashion. What the Romantics are going to do is they are introducing into Western European thought the idea of relativism, especially a cultural relativism. What Belinsky is going to write is picking up on the writings of the German Romantics who also argue that artists, musicians like Beethoven, 
of painters. Painters and, and musicians and artists in general were capable, through their works of art, of creating things of lasting and eternal beauty. And those were expressions, those great works of art the Romantics believed, those were expressions of the divine absolute. When you are looking at the Sistine Chapel, when you are listening to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, or even better, his Ninth Symphony, based upon Schiller's Ode to Joy, you are hearing God. It is an eternal work of art that is accessible to everyone. Why? Because Beethoven was in tune with the eternal absolute. Okay. The art, true art, transcends time and place. Beethoven is great in any culture. Michelangelo is great in any culture. That's the nature of true art. Belinsky argued that this, this, he, he followed the same, the same line of thinking. The true artist is the, tr is the artist who speaks the truth. Social content, in Belinsky's mind, therefore, trumped aesthetics in evaluating literary works. Arthur, authors, he believed, were uniquely situated and morally obligated to advance Russian development by addressing vital national issues, the need to abolish serfdom, the end corporal punishment, to introduce legal norms. Great writers, great writers for Belinsky were those whose works promoted what he would call, roughly translated, social consciousness. Their works reflected truth, big T, truth. So Belinsky is going to exercise profound influence on Russian culture, and he is going to help create this idea, this sort of cult of the writer in particular, but the artist in general, <coughs> as the voice of the nation. The voice of the nation, in this case, the nation can mean not a really. Because just as we talked about this term, it means people, it can also be a substitute for the nation. When the nation is understood to be that collective people, the expression of the, 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 the folklore, the language, the culture, the institutions. So what ends up transpiring now is in men like Belinsky, men like Belinsky are going to advocate this idea of pursuing Western modernization. But they are not necessarily going to argue that Western modernization has to be adopted and pursued in exactly the same fashion that the West has adopted. And in fact, what we're going to see, and we're going to come back to the Westernizers um, next week, the Westernizers are going to come to argue that, you know, amidst the changes that are underway in Europe, the emergence of new ideas, the emergence of new ideologies, maybe what Russia's special path is, Russia is going to lead the way, and we might go back to Palmer's six principles that we talked about at the beginning of the semester, the search for a Russian alternative and a transfigurative act, the most radical westernizers of the 1840s are going to embrace the proposition that Russia can reach Europe's level of development by bypassing all the horrors of the Industrial Revolution. They can build upon existing Russian institutions, and in the process of doing so, they can bring about a unique form of socialism in Russia. Now, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves tonight. We're going to talk about socialism in some detail. But before we can do that, we actually have to say a few things before we finish our discussion of the Western Miners. In the time that's remaining, I need to say a few things about these guys, the Slavophiles. The Westernizers are going to adopt these evolving foreign theories from Europe. The Slavophiles are going to consistently maintain that Russia's future can be found by returning to the Russian past. Russia's future can be found by returning to the Russian past. The, the Slavophiles as well are a, a, a diverse group of thinkers, but we can identify a bit more concretely the things that, sh that they share in common than we can the Westernizers. Because the Westernizers are going to brand it like, like Protestants after the, uh, the Reformation. You know, it's, it's, one's not enough. You don't just have Lutherans. They just, push, you got you know, hundreds and hundreds of different kinds now. The Slavophiles are going to consistently maintain that Russia's future can be found in its past. They are deeply disturbed by the social and political turbulence unleashed in Europe 
as a result of the Industrial Revolution. They are convinced that Europe has sold its soul in pursuit of material gain. Money-grubbing ways the desire to accumulate more stuff has robbed Europe of its soul. Slavophiles disdain European rationalism in particular. And they reject utterly European pretensions to universalism. They embrace, however, European ideas of romanticism, the Slavophiles do. They believe, like the Romantics, that Russia is a young nation. But they believe that Russia can realize its distinct destiny by remaining true to its own spiritual heritage. So we've got some, but that's one of the funny things about the, about the Slavophiles. Do you remember our friend Peter Mogila from the Kiev Theological Academy who adopts that Jesuit training and those Catholic practices to become the staunch defender of orthodoxy? Slavophiles, they're doing the same thing. They're adopting this very European idea of romanticism. They're latching on to it and they're saying, hey, Russia's a young nation. We like that idea. We're going to use that idea even though we're rejecting the Western path. Well, what exactly is Russian? Well, for the Slavophiles, the essence of Russian civilization, the key to Russia's future, lay in the beliefs and practices of the Narod, the common people, the common folk. Legendary heroes embody the spirit of the people, fables and folklore. Individuals and figures like the great uh, folkloric hero, that's an I, that's an L, Ilya Muromets, one of the great folkloric heroes. Ilya Muromets. He's uh, presented as, as in, in, in Russian folklore, sort of the gentle giant. A devout protector, I mean, an orthodox devout protector against invaders, infidels, and monsters. Muromets uh, is, <coughs> is characterized by a lack of aggression. He's pure of heart. He's ready to fight to save Russia at a moment's notice. Kind of like the peasant soldiers had done against Napoleon. The Slavophiles praise traditional institutions. They love folklore, they love the Narod, they idolize the village commune. They view the commune's periodic repartition of land, the collective responsibility for taxation. These are not impediments to economic growth. These, the Slavophiles believe, are defenses against capitalist exploitation. They believe that when the peasants come together in the commune to to parcel out the land, to, to, to haggle over the tax burden, that what they're doing is they're demonstrating the Russian Narod's unique collective nature. Now, how does a commune actually function? It's divisive, it's argumentative. I mean, the, the, the commune is not, it, it's, it's what they have is a romantic idea of the way things function out in the countryside, in no small part, because most, not all, but most of the Slavophiles come from well-to-do gentry. But they never actually especially, Mus especially in and around Moscow. They really don't know all that much about it. They really don't know all that much about it, but they idolize it. They idolize it. They also tend to, to be ardent defenders of Russian Orthodoxy. And despite the fact that the church is effectively a state church by this time in Russia's history, the Orthodox Church's emphasis on humility, piety, the community of the faith, these two are seen, are, are seen by the Slavophiles as ideas around which you can rally and defend yourself against European-style social fragmentation. The atomization that occurs in the urban setting, where community breaks down, the village breaks down, you've left your village community, your old way of life has been completely overturned by the Industrial Revolution, you are now working for peace rates in the factory setting alienated from your surroundings, alienated from your past, alienated from all tradition. You've been utterly atomized. You've been broken up. Those communal bonds have been destroyed by industry. And what drives industry? Greed in the minds of the Slavophiles. So that progress is coming with a terrible, terrible price. This is not to say that they want to reject all progress, but they want to, uh, they, they want to reject the kind of progress 
the kind of progress uh, that, is, that emphasizes individualism, that emphasizes personal gain. The best example of this particular strand of Slavophile thought is a fellow by the name of Ivan Kirievsky. Born to a, a family of well-to-do Muscovite gentry, I guess that as were most of the Slavophiles, uh, he was initially drawn toward uh, contemporary European philosophical currents while a student at Moscow University. Kodievsky is involved in a circle, uh, and he comes into contact with romantic notions uh, before he has a deep uh, spiritual conversion. <coughs> and in the 1850s, relatively late, he is going to emerge as a leading Slavophile theoretician. Kodievsky's basic critique of the West is outlined in a long essay published in 1852. The essay is called On the Nature of European Culture and Its Relation to the Culture of Russia. It's written in the form of a, of a letter to a fellow nobleman. And what he argues is that Western philosophy's one-sided focus on rationalism and empirical knowledge had led the West into a moral and intellectual dead end. The continent, the European continent, Kirievsky is going to write, its inhabitants face a spiritual crisis. It's a spiritual crisis brought on and manifested in the Industrial Revolution and in the ever-expanding number of ideologies and opinions that exist in Europe. European thinkers, Kirievsky writes, are mixing the new with the old, the possible with the impossible. They are surrendering themselves wholly to the wildest hopes, each contradicting the others, each demanding general acceptance. Here was republicanism fighting with uh, representative government, fighting with socialism, fighting with more traditional forms of, of, of constitutional monarchy. The task Russians faced was to avoid that same fate. To avoid that fate, Russia's needed to return to their past. Russia needed not to embrace progress for progress's sake. Russia needed instead to place its emphasis on traditional communities based upon shared values and ideas. What the Industrial Revolution had given was a great deal of personal gain, material gain, more things. What Kirievsky is arguing against is Western materialism. He would write, this, this comes from one of his essays, writing in the 1850s, the height of England's power as an industrial nation. Kirievsky writes, quote, Industry rules the world without faith or poetry. In our time, it unites and divides people. It determines one's fatherland, it delineates classes, it lies at the base of state structures. It moves nations, it declares war, makes peace, changes values, gives direction to science, and determines the character of culture. Men bow down to industry and erect temples to it. It is the real deity in which people sincerely believe and to which they submit. Materialism, the acquisition of things, this attempt to fill em these empty spiritual holes that have been opened up, this is what Kirievsky is, is critiquing. This broad critical view of European industrial society is shared by virtually every Slavophile. They object to European materialism. Now, not every, not every Slavophile is going to reject uh, technology. They don't necessarily do that. There's one more. I've got time for one more tonight. A fellow, this is a very interesting individual, a fellow by the name of Alexei Khomiakov. He's also a well-to-do member of the Muscovite provincial gentry. He's got enough money that he can do whatever he wants. He is free to engage in intellectual and other pursuits. He is recognized, along with Kirievsky, as one of the two most prominent representatives of the, of the Slavophile worldview. His concept that he adds to what Kirievsky has written is the concept that is known as subordinist. It means, generally speaking, uh, consularism. It, 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 it traces back to claims that the Orthodox make about the first uh, council at Nicaea, 
where all the patriarchs, including the patriarch of Rome, who the Catholics call the Pope, came together at the Council of Nicaea and in a spirit of, of consularity, in other words, in a spirit of, of communal agreement, blessed by the Holy Spirit, they devised the basic tenets of the Christian faith. Okay. What Khomyakov believes is that this concept of subordinist, which he equates with a true form of community based upon mutual trust and cooperation, this subordinist is embodied in the teachings of the Russian Orthodox Church. The church as an institution might be corrupted, but the ideals behind the church are eternal. And subordinist for Khomyakov represents the organic, here we go again with the romantic ideas, the organic and spiritual harmony of Russia's native culture. It is this communal, collective body, the option or the mir, because he, he, he abides by that as well, that stands in direct counterpoint to Western individualism. So you have the Russian collective in the commune standing against the individualism of industrial Europe with its personal rights and, and right of free speech and all this stuff that's granted to the individual citizen. The collectivist practice of the Russian commune, Kromyakov believe, are morally superior, morally superior to what the West possesses. And by embracing the concept of subordinist, the Russians can avoid the Western path. What's interesting, however, about Khomyakov is he, he, he embraces the railroad. He embraces the introduction of the railroad uh, to, uh, to Russia, believing that uh, a, a rail network would enable Russia to defend itself better against the West. So he's not, he's not an arch-conservative. He's not a knee-jerk reactionary. Slavophiles are not. They're not knee-jerk reactionaries. What they are reacting against is as much the West as it is the absolutist state, which comes from the West and which was brought to Russia by Peter the Great. Because it was with Peter and his reforms that those old Russian, those old Muscovite traditions, where did these guys come from? They're Muscovite gentry. They belong to the old families, many of whom perhaps had been dispossessed by Peter, who had been ordered to move from Moscow to St. Petersburg. The Slavophiles aren't simply in opposition, standing athwart the West yelling stop. They've got a beef with Peter the Great. They're looking, they read Shadaya's philosophical letter, and they're thinking, Peter isn't the savior of Russia. Peter's where everything went to hell in a handbasket. Because he brought that absolutist model. He brought that notion of service to the state based upon an individualism in which you're trying to acquire more for yourself through the table of ranks and service to the state. You're going to become a social climber. You've been divorced from the natural organic community of the Russian past. And you've been folded into the state bureaucratic apparatus that Peter has brought from the West to Russia. So the Slavophiles are, are in opposition not only to Western materialism and Western industry, but certainly the, the deprivations of the Industrial Revolution, they really are against Peter as well. They abhor that absolutist state model. And that's one of the things, now wait a second, if the Slavophiles are opposed to the absolutist state model that Peter imported, what do you think their attitude is to the autocracy in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s? They're not necessarily fans of it, and that's the funny thing because oftentimes when you know when, when students first encounter this idea of Slavophiles and Westernizers, you tend to think, well, you know, pro-West, pro-Russian. Not necessarily. The Slavophiles have this curious romantic ideal type of what it means to be truly Russian, and that absolute estate brought in by Peter is not necessarily part of the equation. But they're every bit as much critics of the absolute estate as the westernizers we're going to find out next week are. The westernizers, many of them want western reforms, they want, they want democratic institutions, they want parliaments, they want constitutions, they want freedom of the press, they want political parties. Is Nicholas I going to grant them that? No. 
What do the Slavophiles want? The Slavophiles want to return to a quote unquote true form of communal association based upon the Obshina or the Mir, in which the local landlord, the local gentryman, in other words, them, has a paternalistic view of the serfs, the peasants who live on his land. And the landlord looks after their values and looks after their well-being because the landlord reflects in a Christ-like fashion the service that Christ would render unto the people. Now, they're not going to give up their land. They're not going to give up their wealth. But they believe that their vision of the Russian countryside is more in tune with the communal values and the orthodox faith of the Narod than the autocratic state is. It's an idealized vision they have, but we're going to find out next week the exact same thing can be said for our westernizers, especially the ones amongst them who are going to embrace 19th century Europe's most radical and uh, most influential idea, socialism. We're going to come to that next week because I've run out of time.